Next up is your Satilla Riverkeeper, Laura Early, and she's going to be talking about a project that's been going on for quite a while, this really interesting habitat restoration project in the Satilla River estuary. Thanks. Um, yeah, like Rebecca said, we've been um, I also have Dr. Clay Montague up on the slide here, um, and he is our resident and expert on, or <laughs> resident expert on this project. Uh, so if you guys are interested to have any uh, more technical questions about it, he's the guy to get in touch with. Um, yeah, and also like Gordon said, this project has been going on for years. The Satilla Riverkeeper has been involved for years. Um, other folks have been involved for decades on trying to correct this um, issue. So let's get into it. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, uh, basically the impact of this obsolete navigation cut uh, collaboration, which is a theme today, uh, to close the cut, and then um, seeing that project through to completion, which hopefully we're on our way to doing very soon. Um, the link at the bottom of this slide is directs you to the report, the final integrated feasibility study report. Um, prepared by the Army Corps of Engineers, and a lot of the information in this presentation comes from that report. Uh, so again, that's another place to go for more information. So who all is involved? Satilla Riverkeeper, obviously that's us, um, and you can see our watershed highlighted there. Uh, further down here, oops, that's not the right thing. <laughs> I think everyone that's been up here has done that same thing. Oh yeah, sensitive. That, uh, this old dot down here, the Dover Bluff Hunting and Fishing Club, is also a key partner in this uh, project. They are, uh, they <laughs> have been the squeaky wheel, if you will. Um, the Georgia Water Coalition that has been mentioned before as well, um, is a key player in getting this rolling recently too. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, Department of Natural Resources, sorry. Department of Natural Resources and the Army Corps of Engineers are also key players, um, which we'll get into. Okay, so uh, to orient you to where we're talking about, we're in Camden County right now in the estuary of the Satilla River. Um, sorry that this is a little bit difficult to see, but we're going to zoom into <coughs> this area in a minute. Um, Jekyll Island is up here. This is Cumberland Island. The Satilla River flows out right here. We've got several tidal creeks, marshy area forms the estuary. Um, noise cut is right here in this area, and that's what we're going to focus on. So noise cut basically was a, hand, a, a channel that was hand dug in the marsh in about 1910 to float logs up the river. Um, usually you don't float logs up the river, usually you float them downstream. Um, but because we've got tidal action going on here, uh, you can use the Outgoing tide moves the logs, and the incoming tide moves the logs. And when the tide's not flowing in the direction you want it to, you anchor your logs, and then you wait for the next tide to come in. So there's uh, timber operations <coughs> going on up here in this area. It, well, this is in 1910, not necessarily right now. Um, and there was a lumber mill here at Ceylon, uh, which is further upstream. And so to move the logs from here to here, before this cut was here, you had to go on an outgoing tide, about 15 miles down Dover Creek, and then you had to catch an incoming tide and then come up the main stem of the Satilla. So Mr. Noyes uh, decided that you could shorten that time by a whole lot if you cut a little channel right here, and then you can just get to the Satilla. So that's what he did. And then in 1932, the Army Corps of Engineers decided that they should widen that and use it as a navigational cut um, but in 1939, just a few years after that, they made this channel, the alternate ICW cut right here, um, which made this obsolete. So that's not really used for navigation anymore. <coughs> okay, so here, now we're zoomed into this area. Um, we've got Umbrella Creek, which is up here, one system. You've got Dover Creek right here that comes in, another system. You've got noise cut right here. Um, normal tide flow, when the tide comes in, it's coming in from the ocean. And when it's going out, it's going back this way. But because you have this artificial cut, noise cut here, you have an intense amount of water coming in and out right here from the main stem of the Satilla. 
So what kind of problems have it caused? Well, one of the problems it's caused is creating shallows. Um, so I didn't mention this earlier, but when this channel was dug, it was, I want to say it was 40 feet across and maybe five feet deep at low tide. Now it's 10 feet deep at low tide and uh, 400 feet wide. So it's a self-maintaining channel. It's gotten bigger and bigger over time. A um, lot of sediment moving around. Where is the sediment gone? It's ended up right in this area. And the reason for that is the way those tides are flowing. So basically when you have an incoming tide, again, you have tide coming in here, tide coming in here at Dover Creek. Um, but you also have a huge flow of water coming in here and in um, noise cut and coming back up this way. So basically where those tides collide, the sediment stops moving and you have all this mud accumulated right there. So I mentioned that the Dover Bluff Club has been the squeaky wheel. Um, I think their first complaint came in 1935 about this issue. Um, and their complaints stem from the fact that there's all this mud settling uh, in an area near their access to the creeks, basically. So it's narrowing the channel, uh, it's getting more shallow, and sometimes they can even get out of their creek in their boats at low tide. Um, so here's a photo from the 1950s. These are both in the same area. And you can tell that there's a lot more water here than there is today. And so you've got a lot of mud accumulating <coughs> a new marsh growth out there. So one of the, the problems that it causes is trolling, this mud accumulating, restricts ac access for fishers, but probably also for fish and other species. Okay, so the second problem this is causing is that it's confusing fish um, because of the salinity gradient. So if you think about that normal tidal flow, where you have water coming in and water going out, it's going to be salty over here, closer to the ocean, less salty in your headwaters where you have fresh water. Um, but because you have this backdoor flow, if you will, this huge amount of salt water coming in in this upper part of those tidal creeks, um, the salinity up here is higher than it is in some of these areas, so you have a weird salinity gradient going on. And that makes it difficult for fish that are looking at using those saltwater cues to navigate to the freshwater areas. If you're cruising along and it's getting less salty and then all of a sudden it gets saltier, you think you're going in the wrong direction, um, and then you never make it to your fresh water areas. So this is a graphic from that report that I mentioned, and it's just to illustrate that salinity right um, Let's see here. So the blue is the salinity gradient right now. So this is a salinity of zero on this end, higher salinity on this end. So this is further towards the ocean. This is in those upper um, reaches of the, the creek there. Um, so if you follow what's going on right now, if you're starting out towards the ocean, like I said, it gets um, less salty, uh, less salty here, gets saltier, and then gets less salty again. So that's that weird salinity gradient that I was talking about. Green um, shows the proposed solution to this problem. Alternative seven is what's on this graph. That doesn't mean much to you. <coughs> Alternative six is another um, proposed solution, but that's not the one that they chose, and I can't remember exactly what that one was. But you can see that the one in red, which is alternative six, did not fix the salinity gradient. But alternative seven, which I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit, did fix the salinity gradient. So again, closer to the ocean, it's salty. The salinity is decreasing all the way up to the headwaters. OK, so this is one of those slides that Gordon hates. Um, and this is to give you a little bit of the history. Uh, like I said, in 1935, Dover Bluff residents filed the first complaint with the Army Corps of Engineers. And they said, hey, there's a problem going on. We think it's because of noise cut. Um, so then from 1935 to 1983, uh, there were five federal studies done to look at this problem. In 1983, noise cut um, was identified as the issue here. They said, this is noise cut um, causing both the shoaling and the salinity issues. Um, and the cool thing, too, is the Army Corps of Engineers admitted that they were responsible for this problem. So that's going to be key to us solving the issue. Um, in 86, the U.S. Congress authorizes the closure, and they appropriate funds initially. But in 1992, Congress repurposed the funds. So then it fell apart, because there was no action, um, and then the project was deauthorized for lack of funding. 
So that's a, a downer. Um, so to talk a little bit more about the fish aspect of this, um, this is a graph of American shad and river herring and the landings going down over time. So about 50 years ago, these fishery stocks declined very sharply. Um, and I believe, so y'all correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but um, catch limits and different management actions were put in place, but they didn't quite solve the problem. So that's when habitat became a thing to talk about. So this quote up here, or basically <laughs> the title of this report from uh, Restore America's Estuaries exemplifies that fact that habitat <coughs> Uh, means more habitat means more fish. And the, the quote here is, the big challenges that fisheries face are increasingly habitat challenges. Without healthy habitat, we cannot sustain the fisheries that will feed Americans now and into the future. So you have this shift in fisheries management that's focusing a lot on habitat, and that's what this project is about. And of course, I don't have to tell y'all, but um, improving habitat also adds economic value. Uh, so some of the stats here, uh, 10,000 acres of tidal marsh in Georgia, um, or sorry, not in Georgia, in this area, our study area for noise pet, and there's 50 miles of tidal creeks, which is only 2.5% of Georgia's total on the coast. And Georgia's coastal fisheries adds $240 million per year to Georgia's economy. So, with some back of the envelope calculations there, if the habitat is improved by only 8% in this area with this project, that'll be adding $500,000 per year to Georgia's economy, which is pretty significant. Um, so if habitat restoration is the answer for our fishery problems, why doesn't it happen more often? It's difficult. There's a lot of impediments to habitat restoration. Um, one is local community acceptability. It's not always that everyone or in your surrounding area is on board with whatever your habitat restoration solution is going to be. Um, sometimes there's really expensive and dangerous infrastructure removal, so think about dams, taking out dams. Um, and it, sometimes it's hard to identify the responsible party, but in this case, all three of those things are in line. So the local community, mainly the Dover Bluff Hunting Fishing Club, is on board, and they're the ones who have been pushing for this restoration for a long time. Um, it's not re going to require any infrastructure removal. Uh, they're actually going to put in some infrastructure to close off these cuts. Uh, and the responsible party is the Army Corps of Engineers. And it turns out they're also the folks that can fix the problem, which is fantastic. Um, so if you remember, though, the funding was taken away <laughs> and the project was deauthorized. So in order to get it reauthorized, we had to get um, a call Someone locally had to request that the Army Corps of Engineers worked on this again. And then we also had to have non-federal funding to match what the feds could put in to address this issue. Um, so this is an image of a joint resolution from the Georgia General Assembly, uh, led by Senator Ligon in 2013. Um, and it asks the Army Corps of Engineers to fix this problem. The closed noise cut, which will restore migrations of fish in the Satilla River, and tidal creeks and improve routes for boaters. Um, and so I do want to do have a plug here for the Georgia Water Coalition. So um, there was a lot of attention drawn to this project in 2012 when it was listed in the Dirty Dozen Report. Um, and then folks in the Georgia Water Coalition also helped uh, to get this joint resolution. Um, so good partners in the Georgia Water Coalition that brought this to where it is today. Um, another plug for the Dirty Dozen Report, if you have issues that you're working on or issues that you know of that are related to a water body in Georgia, uh, nominate it for the Dirty Dozen Report because it does get a lot of good press and can help you move your issues forward. Okay, so another boring slide, like board plans. <laughs> um, so what happens next after the Georgia General Assembly asked the Army Corps of Engineers to address this issue? Well, then they did a federal interest determination, um, and they determined that they could close this cut. Uh, they were able to supply 50% of the cost of a feasibility study, and then uh, Georgia DNR uh, was able to supply the other half, which was $525,000 uh, for this feasibility study. In 2017, the feasibility study report came out, and it had these great alternatives for fixing our issue. Um, and then in January of this year, that's only 
last month, um, the final report was released. Uh, another plug for the public comment period um, and how agencies work together with nonprofits and with the community. When we put out a call and we started talking to people about submitting comments on this feasibility report, we had several people who were really fired up and they were ready to submit comments against this project because it was the Army Corps of Engineers and we had to <laughs> put the brakes on a minute and say, no, we're in favor of this project. This is a good solution. <laughs> it's going to fix our issue. So we need to have positive comments if you're on board with this. Um, so there, we had a public uh, engagement meeting and had uh, lots of time talking to folks at Denver Bluff Club, um, other folks that were interested in this project. So, Okay, so what is the plan? The plan is, um, this plan, this alternative, as they call it, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, was developed based on hydrodynamic modeling and sediment modeling uh, that was calibrated in the field. Uh, and it took a couple of years to get all this organized, and I can't give you all the details on that. But, um, but anyway, what they came up with is three closures in the estuary. So closing noise cut here, which is what everyone thought was the issue all along. Um, disconnecting Umbrella Creek and Dover Creek, and so this is called dynamite cut, if anyone is familiar with that area. So putting a closure in there, uh, which will essentially separate Umbrella Creek and Dover Creek and the Satilla River. So you'll have three systems to restore this normal tidal flow um, and that salinity gradient. So what the models say is as soon as you put these cuts in, it'll halt the, um, the sedimentation issue. It won't dig out the channel, obviously, but it will stop the problem that has been causing the sedimentation. Oh, and I didn't mention this other closure in here. This is an old creek channel that it has been severely constricted already. Um, and they're afraid that if they don't close it based on the model results, that it'll open up again and then you'll have your same salinity issues all over again. Okay, so you guys can see this, but this is a table from that report that I mentioned, um, and it's all the species in that area that will be, uh, that they expect to be affected by this closure. Um, and habitat is expected to benefit on all the species except for sturgeon, uh, and that's because sturgeon uses a different kind of habitat. <laughs> So where are we now? We need matching funds. So I said that the, the feds can put up money, but then we also need non-federal um, matching funds to get us through this design and construction phase as well. Um, and that is $1.9 million approximately. So how you guys can help, if anyone has $1.9 million to get out of this project, that would be fantastic. Um, but otherwise, if you are interested in this project or if you know of any groups or funding sources that are interested in this project, definitely let me know and I'd love to talk to you about that. So another cool thing that I want to mention about this, and I believe this is my last slide, um, is that this <coughs> problem caused by these navigational cuts is not unique to the Satilla River estuary. It's something that is happening up and down the Atlantic seaboard. Um, and if this is a useful solution we can restore a lot of habitat here in this 10,000 acres, um, that it's a model that can be used in other places too. So we're excited about that possibility as well. And with that, um, I don't know if I have any time for questions, but... We'll take time for one question. No questions? Okay. One, we have a question. Here we go. Are the, are the landowners nearby aware of the, the final report and the, the need for 1.9 million and they have their own issues? Yeah, uh, so he asked if the landowners are aware of the need for $1.9 million to get this project through to completion. Um, and yes, they are. They, uh, an interesting thing is that the landowners that I was talking about, the Dover Bluff Club, that occupies a lot of the land adjacent to these creeks, um, has raised $60,000 that they're willing to put towards this project. Um, so there's definitely buy-in there, and there's financial buy-in as well. Um, but it's it's not quite $1.9 million yet. So yeah, they, they are invested. And, and there's been talk about fundraising initiatives, too, through the Dover Bluff Club. And I guess that's a point that um, one of the reasons that Satilla Riverkeeper is a co-sponsor in this project is 
the way money is handled by the poor. And so in order to get non-federal matching funds to the poor, um, if it's private funds, it can't go from individual Joe Smith to the Army Corps of Engineers. It has to go through a co-sponsor, and a nonprofit organization can act as a co-sponsor. So DNR is also a co-sponsor, and they were able to provide those non-matching funds for the feasibility study. So that's getting at the nitty-gritty of money and <laughs> that fun stuff. So. Good question, and great job, all. Thank Thanks. you.